Good evening, Twitch. Welcome to Birth of a World. On this evening's podcast, we're going to be talking about monster making. In particular, we are going to be going to create... We're going to be creating a monster based on a piece of concept art that has been provided by, by my good friend uh, C. Hillier 17 on DeviantArt. Um, so for tonight's stream, we're going to be taking this guy here, the Vault Golem, uh, and applying the Pathfinder rule set to create a monster from him. Uh, using Pathfinder because the 5th edition, uh, mon edition Dungeon Master's Guide is not out yet. Uh, otherwise, we'll be doing 5th uh, edition. But uh, with no DMG, it's going to be hard to actually create a new monster. So instead, I'm going to use rules that I'm most familiar with, uh, which is actually Pathfinder. So for anyone new to the stream, um, this is an interactive podcast, which means you are welcome to make suggestions, uh, shout out ideas into the chat um, uh, when you want to, although there is a 20 second delay. So if you write something down, I'm not going to be able to see it right away. Uh, so uh, if anyone's got any questions, just uh, let me know. But otherwise, let's get started here. So the creature we're looking at here, I guess we should start actually, let's backtrack a bit. Um, Let's, t let's backtrack a bit. Uh, we're talking about monster creation. So there's a few different ways you can go about uh, creating a new monster. Uh, you can start like we're going to do here with a piece of concept art. So in this case, um, C. Hillier just drew this and, and uh, without any real thought to what it would be mechanically. Um, but uh, Or you can start with a monster concept. You can say, you know, I need something that fills this particular niche. Um, for a good example of that, you can check out episode 3, I think it was, um, on the YouTube in, the, in my archive. Um, you can talk about the creation of the Pyron. The Pyron was a case where we had a concept uh, of a monster before we had any artwork, and then the description kind of grew from the mechanics itself. So uh, this time we're going to be doing the opposite approach, basically taking this piece of artwork here, uh, this nice formidable uh, vault golem dude that C. Hillier 17 drew, I'll just give a nice slow pan over it. Uh, and we will be converting it into a uh, uh, construct type enemy using the Pathfinder rule set. Um, so Pathfinder, for uh, people who aren't familiar, is a derivative from Dungeons and Dragons 3.5. Um, it became popular around the time that 4th edition came out amongst people who didn't really like 4th edition, which does include myself. Um, start to like 5th edition quite a bit now, but uh, Really, Pathfinder is what I've been playing for the past several years, and so it's the rules I'm more familiar with. Uh, so we're going to divert from kind of the 5th edition focus of this stream a bit and talk a bit about Pathfinder rules. Um, so if anyone's played uh, 3.5 before, the stat block for a monster looks uh, pretty similar. Uh, unlike 5th edition, we have distinct things like saving throws uh, and a bunch of other kind of... There's more and more stats, basically, in uh, Pathfinder like it was in uh, 3.5 compared to... Uh, 4th and 5th edition. Um, so we'll be talking um, in the Pathfinder sense, and uh, the great thing is all the Pathfinder stuff you can find online at uh, d20pfsrd.com. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the YouTube description uh, and in the chat right now. Um, so that's where you can find out rules for the Pathfinder system uh, if anyone wants to follow along or uh, look at making your own creatures using Pathfinder's rules. Let's move this guy over a bit more. Actually, not too much more. Okay, so first thing first, um, we know kind of what type of monster this is going to have to be. Um, so we know that this is going to be a construct. Uh, and it's probably going to be large, I think. I want this to be taller than a man, but not toweringly ginormous. Uh, so it'll be a large construct. Uh, so construct is a type identifier, um, something that people who've played D&D before are probably familiar with. Basically, uh, a type gives you kind of a preset set of stats, which I've got uh, loaded up here from the Pathfinder SRD. So a construct is an animated object or artificially created creature. Uh, it has a D10 hit dice, base attack bonus equal to its hit dice, so fast progression like a fighter. Um, they have all terrible saving throws, and they have weak skills, basically, 2 plus int skills. Um, key traits about constructs, uh, they have no con score. We can actually go fill that in right now. We say nope uh, for the constitution score. Um, what that means is that they uh, 
uh, they they don't have uh, much in the way of fortitude, and they don't they're not living, so they can't be affected by things that uh, affect living creatures. Um, what happens instead for HP is they basically they have an HP pool that they're built with, um, based on their hit die primarily. And then once that HP pool is depleted, they don't go into dying, they don't bleed out, they just crank, fall apart with a big crash. Uh, they go to pieces and then they're done and they're destroyed. Uh, other key traits, they've got low light vision. Um, they get bonus hit points based on their size. So we know, we're, or I know already we're going to have at least 30 hit points. Um, this is kind of in place of a uh, con modifier. So we know we can put it in plus 30 right there already. Uh, let's see, what else we got? So we know that we've got a... Uh, we've got N, we're going to say, because we don't know quite how big this is going to be yet. ND10 plus 30. Uh, once we ch when we start choosing the challenge rating for this thing, then we can worry about uh, what it's eight, how many hit dice it's going to have and things like that. Uh, so let's see, uh, we know a few other things that it's going to have. It's going to have dark vision to 60 feet and low light vision. Uh, so um, defenses, this is um, rather than writing out all of the myriad immunities that constructs have because they have a shitload, let's just go over them quickly here. They've got no mind, so they're immune to anything that affects the only thing that is mind affecting. So they cannot be charmed, they cannot be compelled, they have no morale, they don't they react to patterns or phantasms, they don't bleed, they don't get sick, they, they're immune to death effects, necromancy effects, paralysis, poison, sleep, and stunning. But they also can't heal on their own, but they can be healed uh, using crafting skills or certain spells uh, that affect healing. So that's the other thing, is they don't, they don't ever, they can't go take a rest. Delcos asks, is there an armored classification, or is that just defined by AC? Uh, that's just defined by armor class, Delcos. Um, Pathfinder uh, has the, the concept of natural armor uh, that can be on top of plating and whatnot. So uh, the construct is going to have an armor, uh, probably a rather high armor class, um, as well as some damage reduction. This is a common thing for constructs. Um, and those two things kind of make it, are the common traits given to things that are heavily armored. Uh, is usually just an AC bonus and uh, damage reduction. Uh, so let's see, uh, what else was I? So um, rather than write out all those immunities, not normal, it's shorthand to just say construct immunities, and then uh, go look that up in the rule books uh, if you need to actually know, because basically it's immune to anything that affects living, uh, that affects living or biological things, because this is a completely mechanical creature. Uh, let's see, continuing down the list, um, yeah, they've got just shit loads of immunity. You need to anything that requires a fort save, that's important because, uh, let's see. Uh, so that's important, it's immune to anything that requires a fortitude save unless it works on objects. Oops, what just happened there? I clicked. Uh, you less. Um, so that's an important note, that uh, it does work if there's stuff that works in objects. Uh, this comes into play when you have things like uh, Crystal Golem, for instance. They're weak to shatter. Uh, they're treated like an object, shatter destroys objects, and it does extra damage to crystalline objects. So a Crystal Golem, for instance, can be utterly wrecked uh, by judicious application of the shatter spell um, because of this. Otherwise, normally they'd be immune to... Really, the immune to fortitude covers all the stuff that affects living things, the necromancy, slay living, that sort of thing. Um, it just doesn't work on constructs, they just laugh at you. Uh, let's see, um, what else we got for, so, they don't have any armor proficiency, but uh, it has hit points based on size, as we got from the table. Um, additionally, it's very common for them to have damage reduction, um, so that's important also. Let's look at an example golem, uh, just to kind of see what we're dealing with here. So this is one of my favorite types of golem, uh, which is the alchemical golem. Um, so it's a challenge rating nine monster, which means it's meant to be a fair challenge for a party of four level nine characters. Uh, it is a neutral large construct. It has the same basic traits that our, the core construct has here. Dark vision, 60 feet, low light vision, things like that. You can see in this case, we've given, it's been given 12 hit dice 
Um, so we just so it's been built up to a, a it's twelve levels of construct if you want to think of it that way, um, kind of thing. Which means uh, it gets twelve d10 plus thirty. And if we look at its uh, attack bonus and its uh, you see its attack bonus here, that's uh, so that would be twelve then plus its strength bonus, which is considerable. Um, constructs tend to have very very high strength, so you see it's got twenty seven. Uh, and the one we make is probably going to be in the similar range. Additionally, here's that natural armor I was telling you about, uh, 10 natural armor there, plus this one uh, not being a particularly slow construct. You can see it's got 18 dexterity, so it's going to have a plus 4 uh, applied to its armor class there as well. So here's the construct immunity shorthand that we talked about. This one's also got a magic immunity, um, which we might do. Basically, a magic immunity is really, really a way to just say screw you to... Uh, all the spellcasters because it only uh, allows co basically conjuration spells can to hurt it and explicitly the shatter there because again this is one that acts like a crystalline creature. So uh, let's also pull up the animated objects properties just to see if we are... ah yes here we go. So um, we were probably wondering where the the 12 hit dice came from uh, when we're talking about a challenge rating 9 thing it has 12 hit dice uh, kind of where'd that come from? Well, that's uh, that comes from the more detailed things about animated objects here, right? Constructs are kind of a, a subclass, if you will, for animated objects. Uh, and you can see that there's actually a whole system of rules here for how to build an animated object uh, with different traits and things like that. And these kind of flow into um, the construct rules. We're probably not going to look too tightly at all this stuff right now. The kind of important bits to look at are um, things like the hit dice, um, from the sample animated objects, and uh, that's what we actually want here is the building and modifying constructs block. I had not a lot of time to set up uh, for this stream as usual, so uh, didn't quite have the, all the pages I need out. But here's the one I was looking for actually, which is the building constructs. Uh, da, 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 da. So um, this goes into like characters, for instance, can, con can craft constructs, right? Every construct was built by someone. Uh, usually for some purpose. So if you go back to our artwork, uh, it's called a vault golem, or at least that's what C. Hillier called it. Uh, it's got this enormous locked chest on its front, and it's got a big kind of barrel form. Pretty clear that this is meant to be something that protects whatever was put inside of it. So it was built by someone who had something very valuable uh, that they wanted to protect. So let's take a note on this here. So. The key thing about this, right, is instead of being a normal, like a tomb guardian or something like that, uh, it moves with them, right? It's not protecting a specific location, it's moving with the object it's been charged to protect, uh, and presumably beating off, presumably fighting off uh, anyone who comes close enough to try and take them or try and touch the thing except its master. Um, so let's see here, so it probably, uh, these mechanics, writing, writing down kind of how it works will help us inform exactly what decisions we make about uh, setting up its stats. Line art says, check the description, but I basically already got it. So the description, it says, uh, he's a golem construct that was built out of a spherical safe so that the safe itself can protect its goods. Yeah, so basically what I said. Um, he's protecting something, presumably he recognizes a master to let him or her. Right, if it's gonna be if it's gonna beat up anyone who even comes close and tries to unlock the safe, presumably it's gonna be uh, programmed to recognize a master uh, who can come and unlock it. So that's a key thing uh, that might come into play for the roleplay side of things. If you can, you know, disguise if you know who the master is, you could disguise yourself at him and kind of outsmart the golem if you have both the key and you look like the right person. So let's go over to the building constructs rules again. So you can see here, they've got all these different uh, bits of stats for, so Pathfinder's nice because everything's online, everything's easily accessed to read. So you can see we've got this huge list of example constructs here, including how much they cost to make, what they're made of, what their key stats are, uh, what their challenge rating is, things like that. So here's the alchemical golem we were talking about. You can see it costs 33,000 gold to make. 
So he's going to be protecting something worth at least that much, right? Uh, this is definitely going to be a high treasure encounter. Um, most of the systems we talk about have, you know, uh, standard, low tre standard or low treasure, medium or high treasure, that sort of thing, with different treasure levels. This is definitely a giant walking loot pinata, as I think I heard someone say when they saw the artwork. Um, and that's what we want. So this is going to be, you know, probably late in a dungeon, you're going to find this guy, and you're going to beat him up and take his stuff, and it's going to be a huge uh, boon to the players. Uh, repairing constructs, construct modifications, do, 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 do. Is there anything on here I actually want to see? No. Okay. So this is a bit of a diversion, but the key thing is here we've got our example constructs. So, uh, question for the chat, and anyone who's watching, feel free to shout this out. Um, what should the challenge rating of this dude be? How tough is this uh, vault construct going to be? Where's this challenge rating? Remember that uh, for Pathfinder and for most D&D systems, the number is going to be the number of uh, players of that level that it's a fair fight for. Dalkos asks, since it can shatter, is it possible that loot could be destroyed? So, um, it's certainly possible. If you were to, you know, do cataclysmic damage to this guy, like just crush him flat or whatever, you'd definitely destroy what was inside it. Um, but we're going to assume that it's, you know, cushioned on the inside or whatever so that it can survive the rigmarole of, get, of uh, walking around and fighting. So, suggestions for challenge rating. No clue about chat. Delco. Okay, that's for Delcos. Okay, so um, that's fine. That's fine. So I mean, it's um, Pathfinder's on a twenty-level scale, uh, the same as uh, three point five and fifth, and uh, I guess in fifth edition too. But it's a uh, so it's twenty levels. Um, I'm gonna say that this is gonna be a tenth, a challenge rating ten. Just pick a nice middle of the field there. Leonard suggests eight to tens also. So yeah. So let's make this a challenge rating ten. Okay. So we're going to be challenge rating 10, which means it's going to have lots of defenses. It's going to, it's going to has all the immunities that constructs have, uh, and it's going to have a whole whack of HP. So I'm just going to go quickly take a glance at this other construct here and see roughly how much HP. So they give it 13 there, 12. Okay, so that gives us a nice progression. I'm sure somewhere in these docs it's t it says, you know, for this challenge rating you want this many hit dice, but... Uh, it's not forthcoming and that makes me sad. So I'm just gonna go with and say it's gonna have 13d10. Because that's the other example that I've got. So we've got something with 13d10, um, which means it's going to have 10 plus uh, 12, five, so 60 plus 30. So that's gonna give us, is that right? Yep, 3d10, 13d10 plus, so yeah. So, uh, 60 plus 10 plus, so it's going to have about 110 HP. Um, and that's kind of an average. Uh, uh, so that's going to be, you know, an a slightly up of average. Uh, it's going to be, so now we can also come up with uh, a bunch of its other stats. Basically, now we've set its challenge rating. We figured out how many hit dice it has. So now... Uh, so no good, no good saving throws. Let me go and explain. Uh, let me find the page that explains where saving throws are about. Um, let's see here. So uh, there's a there's basic progressions for uh, how saving throws advance. There's there's good, medium. Uh, there's good and there's good and bad basically saving throws. Uh, and just I want to pull up the progression table here just so I can show uh, everyone what it looks like. If it will load. Hello, D20 PFSRD. Kindly catch up, please. Um, so I think 5th edition has this. No, 5th edition has something different for saves now. Never mind. Um, pressed entity too large. That is an interesting error message. Saving throws. Does this have? Sigh. 
Okay. Let's go here. Does this have a saving throw table? No. All right. Let's just grab a class that I know doesn't. That I know has a few bad saving throws, and we can grab the progression off of that because that's what we're dealing with here. So, good example. So, sorcerer, for example, has bad fort, bad reflex, and decent will saving throw. So these are the progression. This is the progression for bad, and this is the progression we'll be using um, for our golem. So in this case, uh, we said it has 13 hit dice. So it will have plus four, plus four, and plus four for its saves, uh, for its base saves at least. So you just turn off word wrap here because I feel like that's going to break my layout. And then we're going to come up with exactly what the saves are because they're going to be modified by its score still. But we know it's fortitude at least is going to be plus four because it has no con modifier. Um, sort of that much. Uh, back over to our example golem here. The CR-10 one has 16 natural armor here, as well as 10 damage reduction. And I believe that's pretty standard for golems of this level. Let's see if I can find out. Yeah, no, we're just adding it. We're just piling on modifications at this point. Uh, so what do we have? Any AC or such things that rely on constitution treat? Do, 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 do. Apologies for all the jumping around for people who are kind of watching this and getting a bit dizzy here, but uh, this is what the creation's like. That's why we do it live, because uh, I feel like a lot of people, you know, who haven't played uh, these kind of systems before might be watching this and curious, you know, what's the process actually look like. This beats the pants off of looking it up in the books. Um, so I'm really glad that they've got all this stuff published and up and online, where you two can go check it out. Uh, da -da -da -da. So, yes, our modification, but... It's not going to give us. That's yeah, just the table of contents for construct. That's so annoying that it doesn't give me what the basic uh, armor class is. Okay. So we're going to go with. Uh, this one's got 10, so it's got 13. Okay. I'm going to say it's definitely going to be towards the high end. The alchemical golem is kind of fragile with only 10 natural armor. So the clay golem, however, is a bit of a thicky. So I want to put it somewhere in between here. I'm going to say that its natural armor is going to be. Uh, We'll give it 13 natural armor. 13 natural, minus one size. Uh, we haven't decided on its deck score yet, so... Uh, that will give us our breakdown once we uh, figure out what its deck score is. I feel like this thing's probably going to be a slow bruiser. I don't think it's going to be a particularly nimble uh, creature, but... Uh, you never know. The other thing that uh, most constructs have around this level is damage reduction. Um, so we're going to put that in here. DR is just the short for damage reduction. Um, damage reduction, just in general, uh, as, a, as a general rule, um, adamantine uh, breaks damage reduction. Um, additionally, bludgeoning makes sense because it's a big... Actually, you know what? Let's, let's think about this for a second here. Are we going to make it resistant to bludgeoning? A lot of things are weak to bludgeoning. A lot of constructs are weak to bludgeoning, and I think I will do the same thing. So we've got damage reduction 10, and you can break through that by using... Uh -huh. Delco's mentions, yeah, it seems like something that would get hit a lot and not take much damage. Yeah, so the damage reduction of 10 uh, is not enough to wreck everyone's day. Certainly a high, en a high enough level uh, martial class, like a, um, a barbarian or a fighter... Uh, we'll certainly be able to scratch the thing, uh, but it is going to be really hard for a lower damage class, uh, things like a ranger maybe, to be able to do damage to it. Um, construct immunities, and I'm going to get, it seems like a magic immunity is also a pretty standard thing for uh, constructs at this level, so we'll add, give it a magic immunity also. So what exactly its magic immunity means? Well, let's take a look here. So we talked, we looked at the alchemical golem first, but let's look at the, the, uh, clay golem here. So the idea with the magic immunity is that rather than uh, the magic just doing what it's supposed to do, it has an alternate effect on these kinds of golems as a result of how they're constructed. So for the clay golem, for example, we say that a move earth spell can send it flying, basically, throws it back 120 feet. All right, so move earth, what that does, well, it does what it says on the tin, right? It's a spell that... Uh, causes a clob of dirt to get propelled in some direction. In this case, you can use it to fling the golem away, which is pretty cool. 
Disintegrate only slows it, though. It doesn't break it down. Uh, earthquake, it says, uh, an earthquake spell cast directly at the clay golem stops it from moving on its next turn and deals 5d10 points of damage, no save. That's a weakness. It's a big golem made of clay. If you give it, if you use an earthquake spell on it, it's clearly weak to that, because that's a ton of damage. Uh, gotta remember that's, that can hit up to like half this thing's HP in one hit, and it doesn't even get a save for that. So it's always, it's never going to cut that in half or anything like that. It's always going to be hitting for 5d10, which, you know, on a max hit is going to be a huge chunk out of its 100, the 100 HP that it has. Lastly, they said that any magical attack that deals acid damage heals one point of damage for every three damage it would otherwise dealt. This is another common thing with golems. Uh, let's go over the alchemical golem and see. This is probably not the best choice, but uh, yeah, the alchemical golem is just weak to shatter and sound spells, which makes sense because it's made of glass. Clay golem, we say that acid heals it, which I guess makes sense, right? You're kind of melting it and putting it back together. I think that's what they're going for here. So question for the chat with our big hulking metal dude. Uh, what is he going to be weak against and what is he going to be strong against? Um. Uh, I'll give you chat a minute to uh, look at this guy and think about it. What's, what are his weaknesses going to be and what is he going to be strong to be? And can the chat think of any other spells that that will have a different effect? I guess we're halfway into the stream actually, so for anyone who's joined us in the last half hour or so, um, this is an interactive chat. Feel free to ask questions and point things out um, in the Twitch chat and I will answer them. There is however a 20 second delay, so uh, anything you ask there will be a delay until I get to reading it. So chat. What is this guy's strengths, and what is he strong against, and what's he weak against? What spells, what kinds of spells, even if you don't know the spell list, that's fine. What kinds of spells uh, have different effects on him because he's a big hulking vault? Lightning, okay. Leonard suggests week two heating over a duration. Okay. Uh, actually, I like that. That maybe that can be like overheat. Uh, any other suggestions from chat? Maybe explosives or rust. What else? Anyone at all? We want, we're brainstorming here. We might not use all these, but every every idea that counts, just keep them coming. Uh, I'm gonna make a note about. is a weakness while he's sleeping. So I'm gonna, okay, so let's go, so let's go with these, uh, so let's go with overheating, lightning, and uh, let's go with overheating, lightning, and um, I wanna say rust. Uh, Liner also suggests maybe extreme cold could make him fracture easily. Uh, maybe I think that's one. That's when you can maybe table rule if you can manage to get cold enough to uh, freeze steel to the point of breaking. That's probably going to be unpleasant for any players who are nearby. Also, <laughs> if you get him too cold, he turns into a refrigerator. That's right, Dalcos. Uh, so uh, lightning does something. Uh, so one thing that I've seen on other constructs before is that uh, if they're shot with a bolt of lightning, they uh, briefly become like supercharged. Uh, there's a the flesh golem, which is like a Frankenstein's monster type deal, and if you hit it with a jolt of lightning, that heals it for uh, something like half the amount that it would have damaged it. So, uh, 
Is lightning going to stop it, you think? Is lightning going to hurt it or help it? Uh, what do you think? Since we've got prolonged heating as a weak as a potential weakness, uh, I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to give it a dex and movement penalty for if it's being if it's overheating and slowing. Rust. Um, that's a pretty simple one. Spells that cause metal to rust. Uh, Uh, so, uh, valid. <laughs> uh, so spells that cause metal to rest affect a vault golem normally. Uh, I think that's pretty. That's a pretty standard thing. It's not made of any magical uh, rust-proof metal. It's not made of uh, aluminum or whatever. It's not made of it. So. That's a note, uh, an exception to being immune to magic. I should say that they okay. I'd love some tea, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we said lightning is going to help. So uh, a lightning bolt spell. Um, so we have a, the, the one that the prolonged heating slows him down. Maybe lightning speeds him up again. Maybe it's like supercharge. Uh, Kuazes. Uh, and we can say... Uh, become hasted. Game haste. And we'll give him haste for two rounds. Just a short jolt. Uh, so, uh, 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 I'm not going to say. I'm just going to say it removes the overheating. We don't want to make it too complicated. We don't want to make it have to go back to being overheated again. Uh, I'm going to say this last two rounds. With the key point that it lasts for two rounds after heat is removed. So if you have someone who can keep a bonfire going underneath him while he's trundling along and steaming, uh, that'll work. Um... I also want to do one thing. Uh, I'm going to give him a note about cargo that uh, if a If a vault golem is destroyed by massive damage, which is to say you made it go splat, um, fire, as in you, you melted it down or whatever, uh, or explosion, uh, there is a 75% chance that its contents are destroyed. So this is the key thing, right? We talked about... Uh, if you blow it up or do something that's going to absolutely annihilate it, um, you're going to lose your treasure pot. So uh, that's a key thing. So lightning bolt. Um, Uh, any effect that causes the vault column to heat up, heat up. Uh, any effect that causes the vault column to heat up uh, gives it. Gives it the overheat condition described below. Uh, let me. There. Now we can actually read it. Um, 
So okay, so we have kind of how spells are, affect this guy differently. So um, immune to any spell that allows spell resistance, basically anything like uh, any spell that's going to just get that. So most magic um, allows spell resistance, which is just uh, you if you resist a spell, you just shrug it off and it's gone. Um, but uh, if you do, uh, spells that don't allow spell resistance are usually ones that conjure something material. So they uh, bring an animated sword into existence, or summon a monster or an elemental to come fight for you, um, or create actual fire and water and ice, um, as opposed to just a flash of magic fire like you get with a normal fireball spell. Um, line art comments, you almost need to find a way to immobilize it first before taking it out. And there we go. You see, we've there's one thing is that um, the attributes of the creature dictate strategy. So for instance, uh, the party comes upon this guy. The wizard racks his brain with a knowledge check to see what do I know about this type of creature. And if he does poorly, he's not going to know these things. He's not going to know that you can overheat it uh, or that lightning makes it go faster um, or that it can rust. If he scores well, then he'll know these things, and uh, an adequately equipped party can adjust their strategy to take advantage of them. For instance, uh, you could have the um, you could have say a druid use uh, create fire underneath it, um, so that there's a, now a fixed point that's fire, and then you can maybe have your fighters keep it positioned in that fire. You know, have a, a your big melee tank guys out and have try and force it to stand in the fire so that it keeps uh, overheating and. Once it's overheated, it then it's much easier to fight because it's taking a dex penalty, so it'll be easier to hit. It's taking a movement penalty, so it'll be easier to maneuver around um, and keep in the fire once it's there. Um, but you have to be careful, right? You don't want to burn it up because then uh, you'll destroy your, your goods. So you basically want to tank it down in the fire for a certain amount of time and then uh, take it out of the fire and finish it off uh, in safety so it has a chance to cool down uh, and not destroy your, your precious, precious loot. So that's, I think we've got a really nice set of abilities here. Delco says, if you want him to face a lower level party, you could put him in an environment where he could overheat easily. Maybe something like a forge or something. That's an excellent point, Delcos. If you want to uh, make the, if you want to knock the challenge rating down by a level or two, you just put him in an environment that's badly suited to this kind of creature. So you say that you're fighting him in a hot environment like a uh, forge, for instance. So we've talked about that it gets a dex penalty when it's overheated. So that suggests that this thing probably has pretty high dex already. So let's see. The alchemical golem is my kind of go-to golem for an example of high dex. And it's got an 18. And I think I'm going to go with that um, a bit lower than that. I'm going to give it a, a 16, I think, which is going to be a plus 3 uh, modifier. Strength, though, I'm going to give it... It's going to be... This, that, this is where this thing's really going to shine, is it's going to hit like a dump truck, I feel like. Uh, I might want to go even higher than the, the CR10 golem we've got here. So we have the clay, the, um, the clay golem has a 24 uh, strength, which is do, 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 uh, 20 is plus 6, right? Ah, God, help me, I can't do math now. Uh, 12, 12, 14, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, it's plus 5. So that's plus seven for strength. I'm going to give him. I'm going to take him all the way up to to a twenty to twenty six strength. So he's plus eight modifier. This means he is going to hit really hard. Um, so it's going to be difficult for those tank guys to keep him standing in the fire. Right. We need to think about the strategies and then try and balance exactly how hard we want it to be. The tenth level party is going to have a decent healer um, to be able to keep the tank alive. Uh, uh, actually, it's large, so it should probably be 20, because it's, again, it's big, it's slow. Uh, here's actually tell you what, it's going to give it 30 feet. So the penalty is now we can figure out, we're going to go, um, we're going to give it a minus uh, 4 penalty to dex. Um, minus 4 penalty to dex is going to drop its dexterity bonus to plus 1, and I'm actually going to take that a bit further. I'm going to say it loses 6 points of dex. So it's going to null out entirely its dex bonus. Its dex bonus is going to drop to zero. Um, which means, oh yeah, we can now figure out its armor class. Uh, so its armor class is going to be uh, 
26 uh, with a touch AC of 12 and a flat footed AC of, I can't read today, da, 23. I don't know why I'm, my brain is just not computing today. So now we know it's we know it's dexterity score, which means we can figure that out. We can figure that its initiative is going to be plus three unless we decide to give it improved initiative as a feat, um, which is unlikely. Um, it's not going to be plus three actually because it's big, so it's going to be plus two because um, it uh, loses a point of initiative for its size. Uh, we can also come up with its fortitude save, so it's zero four plus. Uh, so that gives us uh, three or. Yeah, additional three on that, so we said, so it's going to be seven reflex. It's will, we haven't figured out yet. Um, typically, constructs have in the range of ten wisdom, so it's probably going to be plus four on its will save. Uh, charisma, one. That's a pretty common thing for constructs. They don't talk. This construct is no exception. It has no way of speaking. So... Um... Ditto, constructs are usually unintelligent. This one is no exception. Um, it does not think. It only acts. It is programmed. Programmed to destroy. Uh, we said its base attack goes up with its... Uh, its base attack is with its uh, HP, so it's going to have a 13 base attack. Um, the combat maneuver bonus is uh, base attack plus strength plus dex. So that's going to give it a 16-24... Um, is frightening. No, sorry, it's the higher of strength and dex, so that's going to be um, 13 plus 8, so that's going to be 21, which is still frightening. It's still frightening, a frighteningly high uh, combat, combat maneuver bonus. Uh, so for anyone just joining us in the last little while or so, this is an interactive podcast. Feel free to ask questions and make suggestions as we work on uh, the vault golem, as designed by Seahigger17 and myself, Too Many Knives. Um, all this will be posted uh, on my blog, which is linked underneath the video in the description uh, after the stream is done. Additionally, this full video will be uploaded to YouTube uh, later tonight or early tomorrow for anyone who missed the first half and wants to see what the hell we are going on about. Uh, that out of the way, let's figure out how this thing hits now. Uh, we have nearly, we're nearly done at stats. So it's Malay... So, I'm going to say it probably doesn't have a ranged attack. I don't see any missile launchers on this guy, although maybe those could do something with missiles. I don't know. I feel like this is all part of a radiator system that helps it cool off uh, after we're done. I'm kind of pointing to these pipe-like protrusions at the back here. Um, so I don't see it having anything that can sh be a ranged attack. Maybe you give it eye lasers, you know, if you want to take this and modify it and make it a bit more difficult to fight. Um, eye lasers are always a nice thing. It could also, like, shoot stuff off of this piece of mechanism on the back of the hand, but I'm going to make this a strictly melee uh, type monster, and maybe that's a bad idea, but I'm just going to go with it, so I'm going to give it not a ranged attack. Um, so melee, uh, it's got two big fists, so it's going to have two slams. Uh, there is a rule for a slam attack, I believe, by size. Shield slam, shield slam, common terms. Monster slam attack, you should deal punching here. I want to see universal monster rules. There we go. Uh, just wondering, uh, Delcos is wondering, just wondering what strength it would take to grapple him. So in Pathfinder, uh, how a grapple works is it's your combat maneuver def defense against uh, your opponent's combat maneuver bonus. Combat maneuver bonus is 10 plus, uh, so this is going to be really big. Uh, God, it's been a while now. Um, it's going to be 10 plus bab plus strength plus dex, which is a lot. So that's 10, 23, 26. It's going to be uh, 34. So uh, you're going to need a combat maneuver bonus of upwards of 14 uh, to be able to uh, grapple this guy on a, per on a 20, uh, which means that you're going to need... I believe there's a size bonus too, actually, for this one. So that's going to be 35. Um, so you're going to need uh, basically to have a. So you're going to have to be a fighter or a barbarian, someone who has a good 
base attack bonus progression to be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy. You're going to be level 10 because this is a challenge rating 10 thing. So you're going to have at least 10 um, base attack bonus there. And then you're going to have to have at least a plus 5 uh, for strength to have a chance to grapple him on a natural 20. So that's uh, so that gives you an idea. So you're going to have to have um, the 18, no, 20. You're going to have to have 20 strength uh, to grapple him, and that should be 20 strength uh, regardless of which version of D&D or Pathfinder you're playing. I think the modifiers never changed to that. So by Pathfinder rules, you're going to have to have 20 strength um, or uh, 20 dexterity because Pathfinder, you can use dexterity to uh, make combat maneuvers uh, in place of strength. So yeah, you have to be Hulk to uh, grab onto this Hulk. Uh, so, slam attack, I was looking for here. Uh, slam, here we go. Base damage by size. For once, I can actually find a table I'm looking for. So, it's large, which means it's 1d6, which means it's going to be two slams at plus uh, 21 to hit. Yeah. Two slams at plus 21 to hit, and it's going to be 1d6 plus... Eight. So D six plus eight bludgeoning damage uh, is what he's going to hit. Is what he's going to hit with. I, I feel like there's a way to make that bigger though. What's this guy hit with? Two D ten plus cursed plus seven plus cursed wounds. Yeah, I feel like there's a way to make this guy bigger. So two D slams at two D eight. Let's see. Do we have anything more on the Universal Monster Rules regarding slam attacks, natural attacks? To attack slam. It's that here. In their classifications, some creatures treat one or more of their attacks differently, such as dragons, which always want to strike. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we got anything in animated object, because I feel like there's a bit here that I'm missing about how slam attack works, because that d6 is nowhere near uh, enough damage at this point. So. Grab. No, these are all just different kinds of ways to add slam attack. So you know what? Let's just add some damage here. Let's just give this guy a bit more punch. So 2d10 plus 7 plus cursed wound. What do they do here? Damage doesn't heal naturally and resist magical healing. That's a bit mean. That is really mean. Uh, I'm going to say we're not quite that mean, but we are going to make it bigger. We're going to make it a size bigger, and we're going to make it 2 d8. So yeah, now this guy hits about the same as an alchemical golem, who is one uh, challenge rating lower, um, except this isn't going to have energy damage. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, going to have a 10 foot reach. Uh, that's pretty standard for a large creature. So it occupies um, three hexes if you're using hexes, or uh, four squares if you're using squares, uh, and can hit every square around it plus one or every hex around it uh, for a distance of two hexes. Um, special attacks, it, we didn't give it any special attacks, um, except, uh, yeah, we don't really give it any special attacks, so that's, that's fine, I think. We don't need any special attacks for this guy. We could, though, if we wanted to, uh, add some very special attacks, but we are basically done with this monster now. Um, so let's, uh, let's come up with a description text here. We've always, you gotta have the flavor text that goes along with uh, the monster, always. So let's look at this guy and come up with some nice wording to describe him. Uh, let's see here. Hulking bee. Uh, uh, let's, let's see. A large crank handle and keyhole protrude from the front of its bulbous body. Sorry, let's get this back on the screen here. Protrude from the front. Uh, 
The large crank handle and keyhole protrude from the front of its bulbous body. Uh, let's see here. I feel like we need to get across the point that it's that it's a vault that is a, ch a, ch a safe rather. If it's Spherical safe of a body. We're getting kind of, we're getting a bit kind of awkward here. I might tweak it a bit more. Uh -huh. uh, I think I think this this the, just this two sentences. You want to keep these things this thing succinct. We should make a pick CR. Linert says we should make a pick CR for lock picking his locks once he's mobilized. That is an excellent point. We should, shouldn't we? Cargo. Let's add, just add to the cargo thing. Um, if fault column is immobilized or otherwise disabled, you can't attempt to pick the lock. Uh, let me just think here. Um, so we're you're a level ten rogue and you want to pick this thing's lock, and it's going to be possible for you to do that, but only on a good roll. I feel like this is a nice quality lock. So you'll have put 10 ranks into, so um, these are Pathfinder skill rolls again. Um, obviously you'd pick, if you're doing this in 5th ed or 3rd or edition or whatever, you'd pick a DC based on that. But since we're doing Pathfinder, uh, you've put 10 ranks into your lockpick skill. You have a high dex score, so we'll say plus 8. Um, plus 6 is more realistic actually, let's do plus 6, so that's 16. Um, you have your, it's a trained skill, so that's uh, another plus, so that gives you another plus four, so that's 20. Um, and then you want to roll high, so we'll say on a 15 or higher you can pull it, maybe we'll make a 16 or higher. So that gives a DC of 36. Uh, um, this kind of just, so what, what just happened there was uh, my, tech, my method for basically taking a quick swag at uh, difficulty class. This is an important skill for any DM to get really good at, especially if you have players who like to go off the rails and ad-lib a bunch. Because uh, it will, there will come a point in every DM's career where the player says, I want to do thing X, and you've never even thought about doing thing X, but it's totally feasible that they can do it. Um, so the method for quickly coming off with a DC is basically um, pick how good a roll you want them to have to get, um, Look at think about the, the average level and modifiers for this, um, so that way you're not, you know, intentionally cheating your character, your player, because they have better gear than they should or whatever. Uh, think about um, where you want it to be and just kind of pick a number around there. So in this case, we came up with 36 uh, to pick the lock. Um, so that covers that detail. Uh, so we've only got about five minutes left in tonight's stream. Uh, I'm going to save this Vault Golem, and this will get put up um, on my blog, um, Stone Dice blog, there's a, there should be a link below the video uh, if you're watching on Twitch or later if you're watching on YouTube. Um, there'll be a link below the video to uh, the Stone Dice blog and on YouTube I'll link to this specific article. But, um, da -da 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 -da, desktop, birth of a world assets. Um, which will include a link to, which will include all this description, all the stat block, um, and a link to C. Uh, Hillier's drawings. Um, um, please keep in mind that the art was done by C. Hillier, and it's his. He just said that we can go and use it, so don't go ripping off his artwork, please. Um, the stat block is Creative Commons, and you can use it however you want. Um, additionally, um, basically everything uh, that I put up on this stream, uh, and that's on my and that are on my blog, are Creative Commons. Most of the campaign setting stuff and the various monster creation projects that I've been doing uh, are all posted on my blog uh, with a link below the video. Um, and because it's Creative Commons attribution, what that means is you can take it and use it however you'd like, more or less. That's my stuff that is not C. Hillier's art. You should ask him first before you use his art. But my stuff, you can take it and use it however you like as long as you give me uh, Rob Hicks, a.k.a. Too Many Knives, uh, a credit, and I would love it if you would uh, tweet um, the uh, that you're using it, so that I can kind of see. You can tweet me and say, "Hey, I made this thing with your art," and that'll be great. And I'll mention it on the stream and give you a shout out. Uh, so thanks for watching, everyone. Um, this is the end of tonight's stream. Uh, please uh, follow on t on uh, Twitch so you can 
watch me next week, but I will be back here uh, 9 p.m. Pacific on Twitch on Too Many Knives. Um, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>